I know it's kind of, that's a service that, the, in this case, the electrical unions offer to their members, is all this training, preparing them, making them qualified to go on the job. So, yeah, it's the same, we have similar training within So the I guess the question I'm looking for, if, if Missouri, and this, uh, let's take other uh, right to work states where they pass this law, couldn't the union withhold that training from people that chose not to, and again, I'm trying to find the answer, couldn't they withhold all that training from members that chose not to join the union? And, and, and I'm not a labor lawyer, but my best guess is no, the way that it is structured, they would have to continue to provide that training to those members. Okay, and and I'd love, love that answer if somebody else knows anything different, because that, I mean, that's an important thing to know. Because again, that's a service that costs a substantial amount of money Absolutely does. to offer to a uh, an employer or you know to a union like that. And if the union, not the employer, is providing that training, there would have to be a vehicle for them to be compensated for that training. So, if anybody can respond to that, I'd love to hear an answer. Thank you. Representative Weber, briefly to Go ahead. Uh, do any employee, employers ever complain that they can't find enough qualified employees um, because the employer is a union contractor or because they sign on to a, a security, union security clause? No. Never? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, Kim Inman, please. I'm the CEO of Missouri Association of Manufacturers. Uh, we were founded in 1993, have grown across the state and represent manufacturers <coughs> in many different sectors from very small organizations up to very large. Uh, I did want to keep this short as well. Uh, the Missouri Association of Manufacturers, we do support the right to work laws. Um, and we oppose the legislation that compromises those rights of employees to unionize through the secret ballot processes or which makes actually expose workers to any kind of union intimidation, impose federally appointed arbitrators, and that contract negotiation. Um, they also support the rights of the workers to voluntarily join unions. And, and I think that's really important um, that, you know, ma'am opposes the legislation that would impose the new and costly regulations on businesses. Uh, it could disrupt the way the businesses are run and maybe even stifle productivity and economic growth. You know, man believes it's a person's inherent right to work and to bargain freely uh, with the person's employer, individually or collectively, and that the terms of the person's employment may not be defined or infringed by law or by organization. Um, I do want to reach out and say one thing personally. I grew up in a union family. And uh, I have memories. I have a lot of memories of growing up that way, uh, before and after, during. And you know, there's some good and there's some bad in those memories. Um, I lived through many strikes. I had a father that was a very kind man, and he was put in a lot of uh, compromising positions as a result of some of them. And I look and I see that what the union has done is done, done some really good, uh, provided some better and safer working conditions fair labor and equalizing pay in many areas, and given employees a voice that many years ago, employees did not have a voice sometimes. But I also know that, um, you know, as a result of, we sometimes have the pain of growing. And uh, as we grow up from children to adults, uh, there's a lot of changes in the wisdom that we have. And over those years, um, the government has regulated a lot of those industries, uh, they've made safer working conditions. Uh, other laws have made a difference. You know, the Department of Labor, Minimum Wage, HIPAA, Fair Labor Acts, there's a lot of things out there that has equalized those working environments. And the time has come for individuals to actually have the right to choose. You know, and I, I have a pension, I have a retirement, my father had one. I have good working environments, my father had one. I am not in a union. Um, and I have a lot of family that's been in both sides. And I just, you know, representing this organization and listening to all these voices and hearing them over and over and over saying we should have the right to choose. Um, 
you know, as the CEO of MAM, I ask for your support to change the law to protect Missouri workers and to consider the legislation carefully. Um, not telling you which way to choose. I'm just saying, give us a choice. With Missouri Manufacturers' current workforce development issues, it's vital to grow manufacturing in Missouri and declare it a right to work state. So, um, you know, policymakers are considering reform to restore worker freedom and strengthen Missouri's economy. And I did find uh, some notes. In 2012, Indiana and Mich Michigan brought the number of states with right to work laws to 24. 2015 is the time for Missouri to consider the right to work and the opportunity to, to increase this prosperity and the worker freedom. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Weber. Inquire, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. Um, there seems to be a general consensus that things were horrible, that, that children were working in mines and that things were where the workers were being taken advantage of. And I think almost everybody today has agreed on that, and you alluded to that. Um, and then there seems to be a general consensus that, that people, workers, organized and formed unions and things improved and got better. Uh, there seems to be a general consensus, and you even alluded to that as well. I think everybody seems to agree on that. The part that I have a hard time grasping, that's really exasperating to me, and I think a lot of folks here, uh, is that the people seem to think that somehow if we get get rid of unions, we're not going to slide backward. And you talked about all these regulations that, that we've added to workplaces to make them safer and to reduce abuses. Have you not watched the General Assembly? Have you seen all the efforts to roll back those regulations in the last few years? I'm trying to understand your point. Well, I mean, have you, seen, have you seen the efforts to reduce employment uh, security benefits so that, that uh, women can be fired or discriminated against more easily? Have you seen the laws that would pre reduce protections for whistleblowers, that would reduce protections for children working on farms, that would reduce prevailing wage? Have you, have you watched all these the last few years? You know, I see the negatives and I see the positives. There's a lot out there. There's a lot happening in the workforce. There is a lot of equality coming around that I don't think was there before. Where's it coming I don't, from? I don't think it can all be pointed that it came from unions. I think it's like anything else, that people stand up for their rights, given the opportunity to stand up for a right, they're going to when they have that opportunity. What would be an example of, of some workplace equality that's, that's passed or something that's improved that way that, that labor hasn't been behind? That labor hasn't been behind? That, that the unions haven't been behind. You know, I, I don't have the exact answer for that. I don't, I, I don't I think can't anybody get that does. Okay, I, I appreciate the but, but Do you understand the frustration of people, this general consensus, things were horrible, unions improved things, now we're going to get rid of unions, and things aren't going to go back to being horrible. Do you understand how that's frustrating to a lot of us? What's frustrating to me is all I'm being asked to do is be given a choice. You know, if, if I go in and I have the opportunity to go in and work in a union environment, if, if they're a really good union and they're doing what they should, I should be, you know, if they're doing what they say they do, I should be given a choice. And in some of the situations in my family, I understand and in my the friends, I understand the talk they point. would not, have chosen to stay in You agree that has nothing to do with the question that I just asked. I understand that's your talking point, and I respect your ability to stay on it, but that's nothing to do with what I did. I just ask about, do you understand the frustration as we watch uh, bill after bill after bill that tries to take us backwards. And everybody agrees backwards was horrible. Everybody agrees that. And we say this is the one thing stopping it, and, and, you're, and folks are trying to destroy that. That's, do you understand our frustration? I, I hear your frustration, uh, but I don't hear okay. the same frustration from every person I talk to. I'll, I'll, I accept that, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, like to hear from Mr. Tim Weiss, please. Was that correct, Tim Weiss, or is it Weiss? That's correct, Weiss. Good job. A little German there. Hey, big German. <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Tim Weiss. I'm president of TJ Weiss Contracting. We're a commercial wall and ceiling contractor. 
We work in the eastern two-thirds of Missouri. We have offices in Lake St. Louis and here in Jefferson City. I employ about 250 union tradespeople and staff. I'm signatory to three labor organizations, the carpenters, the painters, and the laborers. Now I'm going to go into a little bit about myself personally, and it's for for a definite reason, and it'll once I, I'm going to be one that's going to be a little long-winded, and I apologize in advance, but I appreciate you hearing me out on this. Personally, uh, I graduated from Mizzou with a business management degree with an emphasis on economics. I grew up in the construction industry, worked for a family business that was started by my father. I worked out in the field through high school, college, and when I graduated, I went straight into the carpenter apprentice program. I worked five years out in the field as an apprentice, journey, journeyman, and a foreman. The last two years in the field, I'd go into the office and uh, learn estimating and project management. 20 years ago, I left the family business and started T.J. Weiss from scratch, working out of the basement of my home. Politically, I'm, I'm a conservative. I jokingly refer to myself as slightly to the right of Attila the Hun, um, but I'm a lot like you. I'm a believer in free enterprise, family values, faith, Second Amendment rights, giving back through community involvement, and economic development opportunities for our regions. I'm a firm believer in personal responsibility. If you have a good attitude, a good work ethic, a good value system and desire to see it, and you put forth the effort, you'll be successful in life. As far as I'm concerned, the Constitution, and therefore the government, promises the opportunity for success. It's up to the individual to put forth the effort to succeed. For the most part, I'm not in favor of big government interfering with the capitalistic system in place. I don't like the fact that we're creating millions of people who are reliant on the government for their very survival. <laughs> we have educational and training systems in place to give almost everyone an opportunity to, see, to succeed. People just need to put forth the effort in them and invest in themselves at times. On the other hand, I believe some government control and oversight is necessary. Government has to set some rules and guidelines to maintain order, competitiveness, and consistency in the opportunities for all. Most of the major rules and guidelines that are in place due today are due to misuse or ab abuse by prior generations. And that's why I'm here to speak to you. First, let me preface everything I say it is from my dealings with organized labor on the construction side only. I cannot speak to the value provided to the customer or end user of the services provided by organized labor and other market segments. Uh, I'm just unfamiliar with them. As you might have noticed, I referred to the value provided to the customer. Let me explain a little bit about this. Organized labor is my labor supplier. I am their customer. I have expectations that need to be met by all of my suppliers. And all three of the labor organizations that I'm signatory to fulfill my expectations. I consider my material suppliers to be key strategic partners in, my biz in the success of my business. And the carpenters, the painters, and the laborers union are also my strategic partners. They also are very integral to the success of my company. Construction labor unions of today are not the same as they were 10, 20, or 50 years ago. Labor understands that their customers, the signatory contractors, and owners of the buildings being constructed expect value, with value being defined as productivity, safety, and quality. For the most part, days gone are the days of arcane work rules, feather bedding of jobs, organized slowdowns, strong arm tactics, in the union ways of the 1950s to the 80s. In exchange for this value provided, labor expects their membership to receive a competitive middle class wage. Healthcare and retirement security so that they aren't burdens on society or on the taxpayers. Now let me tell you a little bit about my employees. They're all highly skilled craftsmen who are very productive. And they deliver such high quality that we, we have won dozens of craftsmanship awards, both regionally and twice on a national basis. This skill comes from the joint efforts of labor and management to develop apprentice training programs and facilities that are world class. 
One of the measures of this world-class claim is that there have been several National Apprentice of the Year winners coming from the Missouri Training Centers. We're fortunate to have two of them apprentice with our company. These programs and facilities are totally funded by labor and management without the dependence or burdens on the taxpayers or society. Not only does the Joint Labor and Management Apprentice Training Program provide skill and productivity training, but this program also provides safety and health training. Between labor and management working together with our employees to stress job site safety through education, communication, and measurement, we as an industry have been able to achieve a sizable decrease in the accident and injury rate in one of the world's most dangerous professions. As further proof of this, our employees have worked 870,000 man hours without a lost time incident. Each and every one of them is extremely proud of this accomplishment and they take ownership of the safety on their job sites. The public perception of labor unions having been closed to outsiders or certain classes of people is now false. Yes, that may have been the case in a lot of instances in the past, but those days are gone. We as a company actively search out individuals to bring into our company and the trades. We identify, recruit, and hire the people that we feel that will be successful in the trades as well as in uh, our organization. Our company is currently working in conjunction with labor and two other organizations to recruit minority youths into the construction trade. We do not have to go to a union hiring hall situation. We do not have to hire the next guy on the bench. All of our employees are basically free agents. They can work for whomever they want, whenever they want. We do have the option to call the union hall to secure manpower, but it's not necessary. Now, the economics. My employees make between $55,000 and $75,000 a year. They have a very good health care plan that is jointly managed by labor and management trustees. This plan is very cost competitive, so much so that I have enrolled all of our uh, non-collected bargained office staff in the Carpenters Union health care plan. All of our employees have a pension plan that's also very well managed jointly by labor and management. These pension plans are between 88 and 93 percent funded and increasing annually. They're not in danger of default, therefore they're not in danger on, in, on, and reliant on the PBGC or the taxpayers to bail them out. After 25 to 30 years in the trades, most of our employees will receive between forty and fifty thousand dollars in pension payments annually. My employees are like you and me. They coach the children's sports teams. They're scout leaders. They sit on school and church boards. They're outdoorsmen liking to hunt and fish. They enjoy an occasional round of golf. They go on family vacations. They go out to dinner once in a while. They're solidly middle-class folks. They work extremely hard to provide for and raise their families. They pay their taxes. They have health care insurance, a retirement account. They're truly productive members of society. They're not a drain on the taxpaying society requiring government assistance for food, housing, health care, retirement. They're good people that you'd be proud to know someday. As a matter of fact, I bet that 80% of the union tradesmen have values that are consistent with a moderate conservative on 80 to 85 percent of the issues with society. The main point of conflict is their membership in the union, which is integral to their livelihood. Now let me contrast my employees with the employees of a couple very good friends of mine and colleagues who are also in the wall and ceiling industry, but down in Texas. Representative Burleson, you still here? I think he left, I'm sorry, but I was going to he, he, made, he made mention that uh, there wasn't any relevant data. Well, due to the fact that I'm in a benchmarking group with these individuals, and we compare financial statements, business practices, everything, I know this for a fact. Texas is a right to work state. They don't have strong prevailing wage legislation. And it's predominantly open shop. My, my colleagues employ substantially more people than my company does. Their average wage for a tradesperson is around $30,000 a year annually. That's kind of redundant. They offer health, health insurance for their employees to purchase at a discounted rate. 
and offer a 401k plan with a small company match. Their co companies perform federal work, so they're enrolled in the E-Verified program. Therefore, all their employees have citizens, their citizenship documented. This is the same as my company, we, we too E-Verify. These two companies are the cream of the crop in their area. They pay the top wages and benefits in their area, and, and they treat their employees well for that marketplace. But it's extremely hard to raise a family, pay for housing, vehicles, fuel, health care insurance, taxes, while trying to save some re for retirement and maybe have a little fun every once in a while on 30000 a year. A much more depressing thought is my friend's businesses are losing a major amount of work to competitors who do not e-verify their employees and they, therefore hire illegal and undocumented workers. These companies hire the workers as independent contractors or in slang terms, 1099 contractors. They pay them $10 an hour in cash. No payroll taxes are paid. No insurance is paid. An underground cash economy is found, is in place. These independent contractors, 1099 contractors, they rely on subsidized housing, food stamps, emergency room health care, and other government assistance programs just to help them get by. They and the underground cash economy are a significant drain on society and the taxpaying public. In conclusion, I realize some of you have bad perception about organized labor. Some might even have bad experiences in your past to back up your perceptions. I cannot disagree with you the fact that labor has caused some of their problems in the past. I can't address organized labor issues outside of the construction industry. But I can guarantee you this. Organized labor in the construction industry understands that they have to bring value to their customers, owners, their membership, and the regional and state economies. Organized labor and management are working together now better than at any time in history to provide value to the economic development in our regions while maintaining a responsible middle class workforce. Now let me ask you, what's the primary driver behind freedom to work legislation? Is it perceived economic development opportunities? Right now, there are about 100,000 union construction tradespeople in the state. This group as a whole is paid a very solid middle class pay package. As I've mentioned previously, these workers are solid, productive, tax-paying citizens. With freedom to work legislation, the elimination of prevailing wage laws, the result will eventually be construction being done in an open shop atmosphere. And as I've pointed out, the wage package of an open shop construction worker will no longer support a middle, life, middle class lifestyle. How many businesses will have to move to Missouri and how many new jobs will have to be created if we turn 100,000 existing good paying jobs into 100,000 low paying jobs. What will the net effect on the overall economy be? I don't think right to work or freedom to work legislation is in best interest of Missourians. I believe the right to work along with the elimination of prevailing wage legislation will lead to a slippery slope of the declining middle class buying power and values, leading to more dependence on government assistance and therefore more taxes in order to redistribute the wealth. Are we not better society and economy with a three-class economic system whereby we have a thriving middle class earning and spending their money? Or do we want a two-class economy with only haves and have-nots, where the haves will be taxed to take care of the have-nots? I'm going to skip this part. Thanks, thanks for your consideration. Tonight. Love to answer any questions. Representative Dorman. Thank you, Mr. Weiss, for being here today. Just kind of a clarification. I think I've heard it three or four times today. We've heard middle class wage. I think that probably means something different to everybody in the room. Would probably. you give us your definition of middle class wage? Uh, for a family, I'd say a family of four, somewhere between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars a year. Where? Or where? In St. Louis, in the metro area, St. Louis metro area, in mid-Missouri. 
what part of it is there? The fine plays in it, here in Jefferson City, in Columbia, Columbia. Fort Leonard Wood, in Rolla, Kirksville. That's that's where that's what they're making. Okay. Uh, would you say that the cost of living is different between the St. Louis metro area versus Fort Leonard Wood area? Since you mentioned that, the housing would be different. The uh, other gas is the same. Car payments are the same. Food's the same. Or more. Um, and then just last question on clarification sure. because I didn't quite understand. Um, you talked about the difference in wages between Missouri and Texas, and it seemed like you were maybe you were a little more um, demonstrative in this in the end. But still, are, are you saying that's because of unions, or is it because the non-e-verified workforce that it increases the labor's supply and depresses wages? Uh, it starts off with with right to work. It's uh, Once again, we've had I've had discussions with the owners of these two companies. One of them employs 5,000 people across the state of Texas. The other employs about 1,500 uh, folks. Both of them point to right to work and Texas at one time, 20 some years ago, was a union state. They, and they both pro, uh, point to right to work and loss of prevailing wage laws is the downfall. Now it took 20 years for them to go this far back. The, the market will determine the, the uh, pay structure for any business. Um, and what took 20 years in Texas, with the speed of the, the way the economy moves, the way information moves, the way everything is communicated, will be, with, with right to work, we will see that de erosion in buying power within five years. So you're saying it is the cause of lack of... That was the start of it. Right. And what's, being, fur right to work, and yeah. what's being further exasperated now is their lack of competitiveness because of the 1099s, which is a whole nother situation. But I had Stan Merrick, who is the owner and president of Merrick Brothers Systems, come up here, and he's the one that employs 5,000 people across Texas. And he, we had a legislative day, and he walked through with, with myself and a couple other contractors and pointed to the slippery slope. Uh, he's, he's not, uh, he, he's not pro-union, he's not anti-union, but he pointed to the slippery slope that Texas went through and, and we're, we're heading in that same path. It seems to me that we're sort of excluding one of the factors there that is heavy, that the, that the labor force has, has grown dramatically. Uh, I, I, I just don't quite make that leap to right to work was the problem there. Just because we have an influx of labor that's willing to, live, to work cheaper. Well, and, and, and I'm sorry. I, I don't want to go on and on about it. I know we need we need to go forward. No but I just want to make that comment. Thank you very much. No worries. I think we need to move on. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony, Mary Hill. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shall I proceed? Um, I'm Mary Hill, and um, I'm not going to give you my actual testimony today because I'm, I would be very uncomfortable to do so. But what I do want to say is, um, and I don't believe anybody has mentioned this, that um, in Washington, the National Labor Relations Board has done just about everything they can to enact uh, regulations that are virtually a car check light. Um, the Department of Labor has a regulation that they put out a couple of years ago that makes it more difficult for an employer to be able to get a labor attorney um, because those things, uh, 
the communications that they share have to be um, given to, um, um, they have to be shared with, with the union. It's, it's a different arrangement. What ends up happening is that the employer can say less to their employees because they're a little bit nervous about it. Now if it's a small business and they can't, um, and they're being organized, um, they can't um, as easily hire counsel because counsel costs a lot of money for a small business. So they have to be very careful what they say because the union will, no problem, file unfair labor practice charges against the employer, and that happens all the time. So um, gagging an employer further than it already ha is, is not a good thing. They have enacted a regulation for quickie election that um, takes the election down from about 34 days down to between seven and 10 days. The faster a union election happens, the more likely it's gonna go union because less employees have the information to make the decisions that are, that are necessary. And uh, employees need to be able to hear both sides of the story in order to make a informed decision. Um, card check, for instance, prevents that entirely. Um, also, they have a new regulation in which um, employers are compelled to give the personal email address of the employee to the union for organizing them. So they have their, they already will get their address, their phone number, and now their personal email, making it a lot easier to organize the union. I just want Republicans here to be aware that employers are, let's just say the skids are greased for a lot easier union organization. And it's not absolute car check, but it's pretty darn close. And when employees don't get to make an informed decision, then it's not right. It's not right for the worker, certainly not right for the employer. It's great for the union boss. And by the way, the National Labor Relations Board is stacked with um, pro-union labor attorneys. Um, I believe there's one Republican on the board. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. How about Daniel uh, Weemster? Did I get that anywhere close to correct? Sort of. Weemster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I will keep this very brief. Uh, Mr. Weiss is one of my contractors from St. Louis. I'm the executive director of the Painting and Decorating Foundation and the Wall and Ceiling Contractors. Uh, of St. Louis. You know, sitting here listening to all the testimony today, you know, one thing I learned is, you know, it's hard to listen and know that half truths are being told. And there was a lot of that today. And please don't take offense to that. It's just because people don't know. And they, I remember Senator Talent, Jim Talent, who I knew and was a friend of mine, he, he told me, you know what I know about your business? He says, what you tell me. That's what he knew about it. He was a very smart man, but he didn't understand the construction business, and he didn't know our business. I've heard said many times, why this is freedom, what are we calling now freedom to work? Freedom to work. Well, what people don't understand is that a union member has a right, if they so choose. They can choose only to pay union dues for that portion of the union dues that is used to negotiate the contract for their benefits. How many of the members of this committee knew that? That's the truth. That's the truth because I know it, because that's my job. I'm not, I don't work for the union, I work for the contractors, but I know it. I negotiate contracts with the union. And every one of my contractors chooses to be a union contractor. They choose to work with the union as their partner, as Mr. Weiss uh, said earlier. 
I, I heard someone when they were married, I, I believe it was Representative Burleson, who was comparing counties uh, to adjacent right to work states. And he, he mentioned New Madrid County. You know, I, I was born in St. Louis, lived in St. Louis, but my dad's best friend was from the Boot Hill, Portiesville, Missouri. And to this day, and I'm 57 years old today, I still will remember uh, spending some summer days down in the Boot Hill with my dad's friend, who happened to own the furniture store, the used car lot, all the apartments and everything else in town. And you know what I still remember about that county? And it's still poor today, I believe, because I still communicate with his children, my dad's friends, is going out with, his name was Trader, to a sharecropper shack in the middle of the field, and him repossessing a refrigerator from the lady because she couldn't make the payment that month. And she said, I'm sorry I couldn't make the payment. But uh, he said, that's not a problem. You just let me know when you want it back, and I'll bring it right back to you. But that's, you know, comparing to Madrid to Right to Works, it, it just didn't make sense to me. And that it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. You know, we've done a lot as a, a union organization, and I sit on a pension fund. And there's a developer in St. Louis that would not have been able to do a couple projects recently if it wasn't for the assistance uh, of our pension dollars and cents. So we mentioned KMOX, the building that KMOX is in was financed through the AFL-CIO Building Investment Trust. That's how it got remodeled. And there's, there's going to be a new uh, building on Grand Avenue that's going to have B.B. King's in it, uh, right next to the Third Baptist Church. And that building would not have been go on, going if it wasn't for our seed money that we were able to provide uh, through our union pension fund. I guess one question I have at the end of the day, you know, someone said there's 26 states now, now that are right to work. And I believe that's the correct number. And my question is this. Okay, let's say we do get this right to work uh, legislation out there. What's going to sell Missouri over those other 26 states? What do we have to offer? You know, at the end of the day, I, I think it gets down to one thing. And I was told this a long, long time ago. When they say it's not about the money, it's about the money. Thank you, I'll take any questions. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your testimony. Jeremy Cady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members. My name is Jeremy Cady. I am here for, on behalf of Missouri Alliance for Freedom. I'll keep it short as well. Uh, just uh, some of our main tenets of things that we support are uh, an increase in individual and economic liberty in the state of Missouri. And we do believe that uh, right to work, uh, freedom to work, uh, whatever you want to call it, actually does uh, increase both of those. And, uh, and we do support this legislation. Thank you. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic yourself. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm maintaining. Um, so so I, I guess you're kind of implying that there is not a freedom to work now. Uh, well, to...